Due to this case's graphic nature, this episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We require extreme caution for children under 13. All right. Everyone grabs his beer, and let's talk some true crime. Jane Tyson was 49 years old, married with three children and six grandchildren. She worked as a teacher's aide at a local elementary school. She went to the Westview Mall near Baltimore with her two grandchildren, six-year-old Adam and four-year-old Carly. As they were entering their car in the parking lot to leave, Tyson was approached by Baker, who put a gun to her head and fired once, killing her. Baker then jumped into a blue truck which fled the scene. A witness followed the blazer out of the lot and recorded the license plate number, then returned to the mall, informing police. Police spotted the vehicle and gave chase. The blazer stopped abruptly and a passenger, later identified by the witness as Baker, fled on foot. The driver, Gregory Lawrence, was arrested. Baker was arrested a short time later, found to have blood on his shoe, sock, and leg. Subsequent testing revealed that the blood was Tyson's. Officers also found Tyson's purse and wallet in the path of Baker's flight. The firearm used in the shooting was recovered from the blazer, and fingerprints from Baker's right hand were found on the driver's side of Tyson's vehicle. Lawrence was also convicted of murder and sentenced to life without parole. Maryland executes killer of teacher's aides, on the opposite side, behind another window, were four relatives of Jane Tyson. The elementary school teacher's aide Baker was convicted of shooting outside Westview Mall on June 6, 1991. The family members asked prison officials not to identify them. A curtain along the back wall of the execution room obscured the state's old gas chamber, just a few feet behind the execution table, on the second floor of the Metropolitan Transition Center, a former state penitentiary now used as a regional prison hospital. Behind the third window separated by a wall from the victim's family sat the official witnesses to the execution, five news reporters and Baltimore County Police Chief Terrence B. Sheridan. They were joined by three public defenders who assisted Baker through years of court proceedings and appeals, all of which came to an end late Monday when the U.S. Supreme Court declined to review three new legal challenges and Governor Robert Ehrlich Jr. chose not to intervene and commute Baker's sentence. Gary W. Christopher, a bearded and graying federal public defender who represented Baker for a decade, had never witnessed an execution. He was there, he said, because Baker had asked him to be. Baker also requested the attendance of Franklin W. Draper, who worked on Baker's case for the past several years. In 1991, Draper watched another client, a confessed killer of 14, put to death in South Carolina's electric chair. The third lawyer, Katie O'Donnell, chief of the State Public Defender's Capital Defense Division, had watched the 1997 execution of her client, Flint Gregory Hunt convicted of gunning down a Baltimore police officer in an alley. Just don't write that it was peaceful, she said Monday night as the witnesses were gathered in a waiting room of the old castle-like Baltimore prison where the state's death chamber is located. Really? Think about it. It's not peaceful. It's hard to read that. At 9.05 p.m., word came to the group waiting downstairs from the execution room, we're ready. A prison official announced. The group walked up a narrow flight of stairs to the second floor. They filed into the witness room. They took seats on a small set of bleachers. At 9.07 p.m., the lights went out. A prison official cleared his throat. A shadow appeared at the window behind the curtains. At 9.08 p.m., they opened. There were no last words. No one asked Baker whether he wished to say something. At a signal from the execution commander, lethal doses of three chemicals were added to the saline drip flowing into Baker's veins. The Reverend Charles Conterna, a priest known as Father Chuck, who ministers to parishioners at St. Vincent de Paul Roman Catholic Church and to inmates at the Supermax prison, 
including those on death row stood beside Baker. He touched the condemned man's forehead and his chest, nodding his head in prayer. He stepped back near the back wall. At 9.09 p.m., Baker's chest heaved. The priest returned to his side, again touching Baker's forehead. About 40 seconds later, the inmate's breathing became rapid and loud, his chest rising and falling in rapid succession. A gasping, suction-like noise could be heard through the glass. Baker's hands remained bald in loose fists. And then, there was nothing. The priest stood, eyes closed, occasionally nodding and shaking his head. The execution commander and the two men with him looked on from the corner. On the other side of the glass, the police chief sat very still. O'Donnell wiped her eyes. Christopher and Draper hung their heads, arms draped around each other's shoulders. The reporters scribbled in their notebooks. Just before 9.16 p.m., the corrections officer Yang closed the curtains. Baker's time of death was 9.18 p.m. The manner of death provided by the medical examiner, homicide. Minutes later, with snow falling softly, the five witnesses and three lawyers left the prison. Baker executed for 91 killing in the gentle snow outside the former penitentiary, about 50 protesters chanted and carried signs. One said, stop the execution of Wesley Baker. Another, Maryland's death penalty, proven arbitrary, proven racist. At one point, inmates inside the facility started a chant of their own, don't kill him. Don't kill him. That was audible on the street below. The silhouettes of their fists pumping in the air could be seen through a window in the building's upper reaches. He was moved beyond measure by all the support you have given him over the years, Baker's lead attorney, Gary Christopher, told the assembled throng Monday night. On his last day, Baker hoped that some good comes of this, he added. And that is that the death penalty will wither away, and that his passing will play some role in that. Earlier in the day, Baker met with Bonita Spikes, a death penalty opponent who visited him regularly. An organizer with Maryland Citizens Against State Executions said his faith is strong, he was calm. I think he's in a good place, actually. Mentally, he's in a good place. Baker's mother, Dolores Williams, brother, sister and friends also met with him Monday. Baker's social worker, Marie Laurie James Monroe, was with him until 6 p.m. She said Baker spent the day on the phone a lot with his family. There was just so much commotion today and so many visitors in and out. And when she asked him about funeral arrangements, he told her he wanted whatever would be least troublesome to his mother. Baker was convicted in 1992 of murdering Tyson in a robbery that netted only about $10. Tyson, a 49-year-old teacher's aide, was shot in the head in the parking lot of a Catonsville mall, less than a mile from her home in Baltimore County. Baker's case has intensified debate about the state's use of the death penalty, in part because he is precisely the person that the state-sponsored study found is most likely to be condemned to die, a black man who kills a white person in Baltimore County. Five of the remaining six men on Maryland's death row are black, and the victims of all but one were white. Two of the condemned were convicted for killings in Baltimore County. Since Ehrlich signed Baker's death warrant last month, Baker's attorneys had filed a barrage of petitions and appeals. They had also asked Ehrlich to commute Baker's sentence to life without the possibility of parole, detailing circumstances of Baker's childhood that they say mitigate his crime. Born of rape to a woman not yet 14 years old, he was unwanted and resented by his mother, who beat him with electric cords and belts, the petition states. Baker was sexually abused by age 5, left to fend for himself in the streets from age 8. Sleeping in abandoned cars and hotel bathrooms, debate over the death penalty has risen across the country. Last week, Kenneth Boyd became the 1,000th person executed since the death penalty was reinstated. In Virginia, Governor Mark R. Warner commuted the death sentence of Robert M. Lovett last week because the state had thrown out evidence. In California, 
Governor. Arnold Schwarzenegger has said he is considering whether to commute the death sentence of Stanley Turkey Williams, a co-founder of the Crips, the Los Angeles street gang, scheduled to be executed by injection December 13. A hush falls, and a man is executed. On the night of Baker's execution, Ehrlich said his sympathies were with the families of all those involved in this heinous and brutal crime. Richard J. Dowling, executive director of the Maryland Catholic Conference, said he deeply regretted the governor's decision. Dowling said, we'll just have to keep working toward the day when death is not viewed as the antidote to death when mercy is the more appropriate, more Christian response to violent crime who represents Maryland's Catholic bishops in the state capital, Annapolis. Baker was sentenced to death for the 1991 murder of Jane Tyson in front of two of her grandchildren at a Baltimore County Mall. At the time of her death, Tyson was preparing to enter fully into the Catholic Church. Many members of the religious community used the days leading up to the execution to pray for mercy and for an end to the death penalty. More than 20 people gathered at St. Vincent de Paul Church in Baltimore for an interfaith prayer vigil December 1, and about 50 people prayed outside the prison where Baker was executed December 5. At St. Vincent, Deacon Bill Pearson told the Catholic Review, Baltimore Archdiocesan newspaper, that he prayed the governor would spare Baker's life because Jesus preached a message of mercy and forgiveness. Violence begets violence. It's true that when you follow the gospel you must forgive. See William Michaels, coordinator of Pax Christi Baltimore, said all victims of violence, including Jane Tyson, were in his prayers. But he called those who are executed by the state the victims of another form of violence. During the prayer vigil, the Reverend C.W. Harris of Newborn Community Church in Baltimore called the death penalty a law to murder. Jesus didn't die for the righteous man, he died for sinners. During the vigil, participants observed a moment of silence for all victims of violence and joined together to pray for an end to the death penalty. God of compassion, they prayed. You let your rain fall on the just and unjust. Expand and deepen our hearts so that we may love as you love even those among us who have caused great pain. Maryland executes murderer. State of Maryland, Baltimore County, to wit, the jurors of the State of Maryland, for the body of Baltimore County, do on their oath present that Wesley Eugene Baker and Gregory Lawrence Late of Baltimore County aforesaid, on the sixth day of June, in the year of our Lord 1991 at Baltimore County, aforesaid, feloniously, willfully and of deliberately premeditated malice aforethought to kill and murder one Jane Francis Tyson. Contrary to the form of the act of assembly in such case made and provided, and against the peace, government and dignity of the state. Baker and Lawrence were also charged in the indictment with robbery with a dangerous and deadly weapon, two handgun violations, and possession of a revolver by persons convicted of a crime of violence. On August 8, 1991, in compliance with Maryland Code 1957-1987 the state notified Baker of its intention to seek the death penalty and of the aggravating circumstance upon which the state intended to rely. The notice sent to Baker stated, Punishment for murder. Penalty for first-degree murder. Except as provided under subsection of this section. A person found guilty of murder in the first degree shall be sentenced to death, imprisonment for life, or imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole. The sentence shall be imprisonment for life unless, the state notified the person in writing at least 30 days prior to trial that it intended to seek a sentence of death, and advised the person of each aggravating circumstance upon which it intended to rely and a sentence of death is imposed in accordance with or the state notified the person in writing at least 30 days prior to trial that it intended to seek a sentence of imprisonment for life without the possibility of parole under or of this article. Notice of intention to seek sentence of death now comes the state of Maryland by and through Sandra A. O'Connor, state's attorney for Baltimore County, and S.
Ann Brobst, Assistant State's Attorney for Baltimore County, and says, pursuant to Maryland Annotated Code, Article 27, Section 412, the state of Maryland is hereby notifying you the defendant in the above indictment which charges you with the murder of Jane Francis Tyson, robbery with a dangerous and deadly weapon of Jane Francis Tyson and other lesser offenses under indictment number 91 CR, of its intention to seek the sentence of death. Pursuant to Maryland Annotated Code, Article 27, Section 412. The state of Maryland also notifies you that it intends to rely on the following aggravating circumstance under Maryland Annotated Code, Article 27, Section 413. Maryland Code states, Sentencing procedure upon finding of guilty of first-degree murder. Consideration of aggravating circumstances. In determining the sentence, the court or jury, as the case may be, shall first consider whether, beyond a reasonable doubt, any of the following aggravating circumstances exist, the defendant committed the murder while committing or attempting to commit a robbery, arson, rape or sexual offense in the first degree. The defendant committed the murder of Jane Francis Tyson in the first degree while committing or attempting to commit a robbery of Jane Francis Tyson on June 6, 1991, as charged in indictment number 91 CR. On his motion, pursuant to Maryland Rule 4-254, Baker's trial was moved from Baltimore County to Harford County. On October 26, 1992, after a jury trial in the circuit court for Harford County, Baker was found guilty of the first-degree murder of Mrs. Tyson, the robbery of Mrs. Tyson with a deadly weapon, and the use of a handgun in the commission of a felony. Based on a request by Baker, the jury considered whether Baker was a principal in the first degree and found that he was. Maryland Rule 4-254 states, in relevant part, that, Rule 4-254. Reassignment and removal. When a defendant is charged with an offense for which the maximum penalty is death and either party files a suggestion under oath that the party cannot have a fair and impartial trial in the court in which the action is pending, the court shall order that the action be transferred for trial to another court having jurisdiction. A suggestion by a defendant shall be under the defendant's personal oath. A suggestion filed by the state shall be under the oath of the state's attorney. On October 27, 1992, the sentencing hearing commenced, at which time Baker had to make a determination as to whether he wanted to be sentenced by the circuit court or by a jury. The following exchange occurred prior to the sentencing hearing. The court, okay. We would propose at this point to advise Mr. Baker of his right to be sentenced by either a court or a jury, and get that election made. Defendant ready to proceed on that point? Mr. Galvin, we are, Your Honor. Roger Galvin and Rodney Warren were the attorneys representing Baker. The court, had adequate time to review this question with the defendant? Mr. Galvin, I believe we have. The court, Mr. Baker, do you feel you have had adequate time to review with counsel the issue of the election of either court or jury to impose the sentence? The defendant, yes. The court, we have now concluded the guilt phase of the trial, and you have been convicted, Mr. Baker, of murder in the first degree both as to premeditated murder and as to felony murder. In addition, the jury has found beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty that you were a principal in the first degree. That is, that you committed the murder with your own hands. That second part normally can be left to the sentencing phase. Here it was your request that that be included as a part of the guilt-innocence phase. The state did not object to that. So we submitted the question to the jury, that a jury has made that determination. And that is now a binding determination. So, that issue is behind us. The next phase of the trial is the actual sentencing phase. It will be decided whether the sentence to be imposed on the murder conviction should be death, life without parole, or life imprisonment. Your trial was conducted above before a jury. 
you are not obligated to maintain that same election for sentencing. However, because you were tried by a jury, if you elect to be sentenced by a jury, you will be sentenced by the same jury to consider guilt or innocence. So, if you have a jury, the same 12 people will be that unless we have had to excuse one, in which case one of the alternates would be used. A jury is comprised of 12 citizens selected from the voter rolls of this jurisdiction. You and your attorneys have participated in the voir dire process where the potential jurors were examined and we selected the 12 jurors and the alternates. If any juror held a belief or any potential juror held a belief either for or against capital punishment, which would prevent or substantially impair that juror from being impartial, that juror has not been allowed to serve as a juror in this case. In order to secure a death sentence, it is the obligation of the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you were a principal in the first degree to the murder. So, that's been submitted and that's been determined, and that determination is binding at this point. The state also has the burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravated circumstances listed in the notice of intent to seek a death penalty exist. The same burden of proof standard will prove beyond a reasonable doubt exists regardless of whether you elect to be sentenced by the court or by a jury. If you elect to be sentenced by a jury, each of these threshold determinations must be unanimous. And I am telling you that you have had the unanimous determination and that you were a principal in the first degree. So, the next determination is whether or not the aggravated circumstances exist and that must be unanimous, and it must be beyond a reasonable doubt. If the sentencer, whether it be the court or jury, finds the state has satisfied its burden, the sentencer will go on to consider whether any mitigating circumstances exist. Mitigating circumstances are any circumstances relating either to yourself or this trial that would tend to make the sentence of death less appropriate. The statute lists seven circumstances that are considered to be mitigating. To be considered, there must be proof of the existence of any of these circumstances by preponderance of the evidence. This burden exists whether the sentencer is the court or the jury. In addition to the seven listed mitigating circumstances, the sentencer may write down any other fact or circumstance it finds to be mitigating. That is, anything about you or the crime that would make death less appropriate. Again, mitigating circumstances must exist by a preponderance of the evidence. Further, it is necessary to convince the sentencer that both the fact and the circumstance exists, and that it is mitigating. As with the listed mitigating circumstances, this is the same whether the sentencer is the court or jury. Unlike the matters on which the state bears the burden of proof, if you elect to be sentenced by a jury, the jury need not be unanimous with respect to whether a particular mitigating circumstance exists. This is true as to both the statutory or the mitigating circumstances, and the non-statutory mitigating circumstances. That's a non-statutory, whether or not, is mitigating in the mind of the jury. If, after a period of deliberation, the sentencing jury cannot unanimously agree on the existence of a particular mitigating circumstance, those jurors finding the mitigating circumstance will be instructed to consider it in determining the appropriate sentence. Those jurors finding that the mitigating circumstances do not exist will not consider it. Only if the jury unanimously finds that no mitigating circumstance exists, the sentence of death be entered without a balancing process. If at least one juror finds at least one mitigating circumstance, a balancing process will result. Similarly, if the court is a sentencer, a sentence of death will be imposed without a balancing process only if no mitigating circumstance is found. So, as long as at least one mitigating circumstance is found, a balancing process will result. If the court, sitting as the sentencer, finds both that an aggravating circumstance has been proven and that a mitigating circumstance exists, 
the court will balance the mitigating circumstance or circumstances found to exist against the aggravating circumstance or circumstances proven beyond a reasonable doubt to determine whether the sentence would be death or not death. The same balancing process is undertaken by a jury sitting as the sentencer where the jury unanimously concludes that an aggravating circumstance has been proven, and at least one juror concludes that a mitigating circumstance exists. Whether the sentencer is a court or a jury, the state bears the ultimate burden to establish the propriety of a death sentence. If the sentencer, whether court or jury, concludes that the mitigating circumstances outweigh the aggravating circumstances, the sentence shall not be death. If the mitigating circumstances and the aggravating circumstances are an even balance, the sentence shall not be death. Only if the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances is a sentence of death to be imposed. Where the sentencer is the jury, the outcome of the balance must be a unanimous conclusion of the jury. That is, all twelve must agree. The need for jury unanimity has been noted on several occasions. If, after a reason period of deliberation, the jury is unable to reach agreement unanimously on any matter for which unanimity is required, including whether a sentence of death should be imposed, a sentence of death shall not be imposed. If the sentencer determines that the sentence shall not be death, then the same sentencer shall proceed to determine whether the sentence should be life or life without parole. If the sentencer is a jury and they are unable to reach a verdict on the issue of death within a reasonable time, the same jury shall, nevertheless, proceed to consider the question of life or life without parole. If the sentencer is a jury, a sentence of life without parole must be a unanimous decision. If the jury cannot achieve unanimity on the issue of life without possibility of parole after a reasonable period of deliberation, a sentence of life must be imposed. If you choose the court as a sentencer, then I must consider whether life or life without parole is appropriate, if I determine that death is not the proper sentence. First, did I cover adequately did I make any mistakes in reading it? Miss Brobst, the state is satisfied. Your Honor. Thank you very much. The State of Maryland was represented by Sandra A. O'Connor, the State's Attorney for Baltimore County, and S. N. Brobst, an Assistant State's Attorney for Baltimore County. The Court, Mr. Galvin, Mr. Warren, do you feel I have adequately covered the instructions? Mr. Galvin, we do, Your Honor. The Court, Mr. Baker, do you have any questions concerning what I have said to you here? The defendant, no. The court, have you had an opportunity to discuss this election with your attorneys? The defendant, yes, sir. The court, have you had sufficient opportunity? The defendant, yes. The court, are there any questions that you have of them that they have been either unwilling or unable to answer? The defendant, no. The court, what is your age? The defendant, 34 sir. The court, how far did you go in school? The defendant, GED the court, how many years did you actually attend? The defendant, to the seventh. The court, prior to coming here today, have you had any medication, or drugs, or alcohol that would affect your ability to understand my instructions, hear my questions, and answer my questions? The defendant, no, your honor. The court, are you prepared to make an election to whether you wish to proceed with the sentencing by court or jury? The defendant, yes, I have. The court, what is your election? The defendant, sentenced by the court. The court, sentenced by the court? The defendant, yes. The court, you understand the jury will be discharged and have no further participation in the matter? The defendant, yes. The court, do you feel you have had adequate time on this? Are you satisfied to make this election now since it is final? Once you make it, and that jury is discharged, you can't change your mind. Do you understand that? The defendant, yes, your honor. The court, do you wish to have further time to discuss this in any way with your attorneys? 
The defendant, no, sir. The court, then I will accept the election for the sentencing process to be with the court. We will discharge the jury. On October 30, 1992, after the sentencing hearing, the circuit court sentenced Baker to death for his conviction for murder. The circuit court also sentenced Baker to 20 years incarceration for robbery with a deadly weapon and to a consecutive 20 years incarceration for the use of a handgun in the commission of a felony. On January 28, 1993, Baker filed a motion for reconsideration of sentence which was denied by the circuit court. After receiving his death sentence, Baker filed an appeal. The appeal and an automatic review of his sentence by this court in accordance with Maryland Code 1957, 1987 Article 27 Section 414, were consolidated. Baker's sentence and his conviction were affirmed by this court. On December 23, 1994, Baker filed a petition for post-conviction relief in the circuit court for Harford County. In his petition, Baker alleged that he had been denied his constitutional right to a fair and impartial jury as the voir dire process resulted in a prosecution-prone jury. He was denied his constitutional right to a trial by a jury selected from a fair cross-section of the community by the discriminating selection of the petty jury. And he was denied the effective assistance of trial counsel in violation of the 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution and the Maryland Declaration of Rights. After a hearing was held on July 6 and July 7, 1995, the Circuit Court for Harford County issued a memorandum opinion that denied Baker's petition for post-conviction relief. On October 21, 1996, Baker, pursuant to Maryland Code 1957, 1996, Article 27 Section 645A filed a motion to reopen the post-conviction proceeding. This motion was denied by the Circuit Court for Harford County on December 19, 1996. Maryland Code 1957, 1996 Article 27 Section 645A states that the court may in its discretion reopen a post-conviction proceeding that was previously concluded if the court determines that such action is in the interests of justice. Baker then filed a petition for writ of habeas corpus in the United States District Court for the District of Maryland pursuant to 28 Jews. See this petition was denied and the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit affirmed the District Court's decision. On March 9, 2001, Baker filed a motion for new sentencing in the Circuit Court for Harford County based on newly discovered evidence. On March 22, 2001, Baker filed a motion to correct a legal sentence and for new sentencing based upon mistake and irregularity in the Circuit Court for Harford County. Both motions were denied by the Circuit Court on April 2, 2001. Baker filed a notice of appeal to this court after the judgments of the Circuit Court. Baker has presented six questions for our review. 1. Whether Mr. Baker made an unknowing and unintelligent waiver of his right to sentencing by jury when the trial court improperly advised him of what he was waiving? 2. Whether Maryland's death penalty statute is now unconstitutional on its face, because it allows a sentence of death to be imposed if the state proves only that the aggravating circumstances outweigh any mitigating circumstances by a preponderance of the evidence? 3. Whether the court was without jurisdiction to impose a sentence of death because the indictment failed to allege all of the elements of capital murder? 4. Whether the rights identified by the Supreme Court's decision in Apprenti apply to Mr. Baker? 5. Whether, as a matter of fundamental fairness, and pursuant to Article 24 of the Maryland Declaration of Rights, this court should now hold that no sentence of death in Maryland is permissible unless the finder of fact unanimously finds beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating circumstances outweigh the mitigating circumstances? 6. Whether the circuit court erred and abused its discretion in denying the motion for new sentencing based on newly discovered evidence? 
Wesley Eugene Baker appeals an order of the district court denying his petition for a writ of habeas corpus, in which he challenged his convictions and death sentence for the murder of Jane Tyson. C-28 Jews. C-A The State Cross appeals an order of the district court denying its motion to dismiss Baker's petition as untimely under 28 Jews. C.A. maintaining that the district court incorrectly ruled that Maryland has not satisfied the opt-in requirements of 28 Jews. C.A. We conclude that Maryland has not satisfied the opt-in requirements and that Baker is not entitled to habeas relief. Accordingly, we affirm. Baker named Eugene Newth, warden of the Maryland Correctional Adjustment Center where Baker is incarcerated and Attorney General J. Joseph Curran, Jr. as respondents. Newth has since been replaced by Thomas R. Corcoran. For ease of reference, we refer to respondents as the state throughout this opinion. Because Baker's petition for a writ of habeas corpus was filed after the April 24, 1996 enactment of the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, on the evening of June 6, 1991, Tyson went to the Westview Mall near Baltimore, Maryland with her grandchildren, six-year-old Adam and four-year-old Carly. Tyson was shot as the three were entering Tyson's maroon Buick to return home. At the time of the shooting, Carly had entered the back seat, Adam was preparing to enter the front passenger seat, and Tyson was preparing to enter the driver's seat. Adam saw a man run up to Tyson, heard her scream, and saw the man shoot her in the head. The man then entered the left side of a blue truck and drove away. A subsequent autopsy revealed that Tyson was killed by a single gunshot wound to the head. Forensic evidence indicated that the weapon was in contact with Tyson's temple at the time of the shooting. Scott Faust happened upon the scene within seconds of the shooting. He observed a blue Chevy Blazer facing west and a maroon Buick facing east. The two vehicles were parallel to each other and separated by a distance of approximately 10 feet. Faust observed two men run from the vicinity of the Buick and enter the Blazer. The passenger, whom Faust subsequently identified as Baker, was wearing a dark t-shirt and a baseball hat. The driver, subsequently identified as Gregory Lawrence, was wearing a bright orange t-shirt. Faust then saw Tyson lying near the driver's side door of the Buick. Faust followed the blazer out of the mall parking lot, eventually getting close enough to record the license plate number and to observe Lawrence and Baker. He then returned to the mall and provided this information to the police. Shortly thereafter, Baltimore County police officers spotted the blazer and gave chase. The blazer stopped abruptly and a passenger, who was dressed in dark clothing, fled on foot. The officers stopped the blazer a short distance away and arrested the driver, Gregory Lawrence. Baker was arrested a short time later, and at that time officers observed what appeared to be blood on his shoe, sock, and leg. Subsequent testing revealed that the blood was Tyson's. Officers found Tyson's purse, wallet, and photograph holder on the path of Baker's flight. Other items belonging to Tyson were found in the blazer, as was the firearm that had been used to shoot her. Additionally, fingerprints from Baker's right hand were found on the driver's side door and window of the Buick. Baker was charged with first-degree premeditated murder, first-degree felony murder, robbery with a deadly weapon, and use of a handgun during the commission of a felony. Trial counsel elected to concede Baker's involvement in the offenses in favor of arguing that Baker was not a principal in the first degree, that is, he did not shoot Tyson. At counsel's request, the jury was instructed to return a special verdict indicating whether the state had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Baker was a principal in the first degree. A no response would have rendered Baker ineligible for the death penalty. The jury subsequently convicted Baker of the charged offenses and found that he was a principal in the first degree. Baker chose to be sentenced by the court rather than by the jury. During his case in mitigation, Baker presented the testimony of Dr. Robert Johnson, 
who stated that Baker was unlikely to be a danger to other inmates if sentenced to life imprisonment. Defense counsel then informed the court that they had intended to call two additional witnesses, Baker's mother, Dolores Williams, and social worker Lori James, to testify regarding Baker's family history, but that Baker had directed counsel not to call those witnesses because there were going to be very painful kinds of things testified about. Counsel further stated that we have to respect, man to man, Mr. Baker's very clear, unequivocal, and express directions to us. A lengthy discussion followed, during which the court considered calling Williams and James as court witnesses but decided not to do so after Baker informed the court that he did not want the evidence introduced because he thought it would be damaging and for personal reasons. After hearing argument from the parties, the court sentenced Baker to death. The court first independently determined that the state had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Baker was a principal in the first degree. The court then found that the state had established one aggravating circumstance, that the murder was committed in the course of the robbery. The court found no mitigating circumstances, explicitly rejecting Drive Johnson's testimony that Baker was unlikely to pose a danger to others if sentenced to life imprisonment. Additionally, the court noted that even if it had considered Dr. Johnson's testimony as establishing a mitigating circumstance, it would have found that the mitigating circumstance was outweighed by the aggravating circumstance. Shortly thereafter, Baker moved for reconsideration of his sentence, stating that he had reflected upon his decision not to call on his behalf and realized that he made a serious error in judgment. Baker also requested that the court consider testimony from his brother and son. The court granted the motion, and defense counsel presented testimony from James. James testified that Baker was raised in a dysfunctional family that consisted of Baker's mother, his stepfather, and his siblings. James testified that Baker was the product of the rape of his mother, a fact of which he was unaware until the sentencing phase of his trial. She further stated that although Baker was never physically abused, he observed his stepfather beating his mother. James also found that Baker's family had poor communication patterns and that several family members abused drugs. The court considered this information and found that it was not mitigating, and therefore elected not to reduce Baker's sentence. Baker's mother was not present for the proceeding due to a miscommunication. The record does not reveal why Baker's brother and son did not testify. Counsel did not assert that Baker's origins constituted a mitigating circumstance. Rather, the information was offered as an explanation of why Baker refused to present James and Williams' testimony at the initial sentencing hearing. Additionally, James asserted that Baker's lack of knowledge about the rape of his mother was indicative of a pattern of keeping secrets that was part of the dysfunctionality of the family. James uncovered one instance of sexual abuse, in which Baker was molested by two teenage girls when he was less than five years old. Baker then appealed his convictions and sentence to the Maryland Court of Appeals. Among other things, Baker argued that the trial court had improperly instructed the jury that premeditation could be inferred from the intensity and effect of a wound, asserting that such an instruction had no basis in Maryland law. The Maryland Court of Appeals affirmed, and the United States Supreme Court denied certiorari. Baker filed a petition for post-conviction relief in December 1994. As is relevant here, Baker maintained that trial counsel were constitutionally ineffective for failing to conduct any independent investigation of the case. For conceding Baker's principalship during closing argument, and for failing to present testimony from Williams and James at the initial sentencing hearing. Following a hearing, the PCR court denied relief. The Maryland Court of Appeals denied Baker's application for leave to appeal, and the United States Supreme Court denied certiorari. The United States District Court for the District of Maryland subsequently appointed federal habeas counsel for Baker. In October 1996, 
Baker moved through counsel to reopen the state PCR proceedings, asserting that certain claims had not been presented in his initial PCR proceeding due to post-conviction counsel's incompetence. The motion to reopen and a subsequent addendum included the following claims, that the trial court issued an unconstitutional instruction regarding the meaning of reasonable doubt that trial and appellate counsel were constitutionally ineffective for failing to object to the reasonable doubt instruction and to challenge it on appeal. That trial counsel's failure to conduct an investigation resulted in the failure to discover evidence indicating the existence of a third participant in the crime. That trial counsel were ineffective for failing to obtain an expert examination of the murder weapon. And that trial counsel failed to investigate Gregory Lawrence. Following a non-evidentiary hearing, the state court denied the motion to reopen in a letter ruling. The Maryland Court of Appeals subsequently denied Baker's application for leave to appeal. Baker filed his federal petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Baker further claims that damage done by conceding guilt was aggravated by counsel's statement that hen you don't have a case, you do what you can. Baker claims that in making this comment counsel disparage his own candor and paint himself as a gamesman willing to do what can in a hopeless and desperate situation. In sum, we conclude that Marilyn has not satisfied the Ogden requirements of, and accordingly that Baker's habeas petition was timely filed. We also determine, however, that Baker is not entitled to relief on any of his claims. Therefore, we affirm the district court in all respects. Additionally, we conclude that the district court properly denied Baker's request for an evidentiary hearing. His final meal was breaded fish, pasta marinara, green beans, orange fruit punch, bread and milk.